This Airbus A320 is cruising along at 37,000 feet over continental United States. From the outside, everything looks normal, but no one has been able to reach the pilots of this aircraft close to one and a half hours. What's happening inside? Stay tuned. A huge thank you to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. In order for you to understand the story behind Northwest Airlines Flight 188, you need to understand a little bit about the landscape in which the airlines operated in the United States after 9-11. The terrorist attacks on 9-11, together with some other economical factors, had come together to make it really, really hard for these airlines to survive. This had led to several Chapter 11 bankruptcy protections for some of the airlines, and that in turn led to a lot of big mergers between these airlines between the years of 2004 and 2008. One of those mergers was between Delta Airlines and Northwest Airlines, and that happened in October 2008. After that merger, this new company became the world's biggest airline for a while. Now, whenever you have a merger in an airline, there's going to be friction. That's because these two company cultures come together and you will have things like seniority lists, for example, that need to be merged in together. And this can lead to some pilots or cabin crew feeling that they're being pushed down in seniority because suddenly there are maybe hundreds of people that come in on top of them. But on top of that, you also have changes to standard operating procedures, how the aircraft are actually being flown. This was also true in the Northwest and Delta merger, and they had changes to, for example, how the pre-flight setup looked. So prior to the merger in Northwest, the captain would be the person who always set up the FMC and the overhead panel in the aircraft. And after the merger, the pilot flying set up the FMC and the first officer would then set up the overhead panel. Now, these are small changes, but when you have been used to operate an aircraft in a certain way for many, many years, and all of a sudden you're told to operate the same aircraft in a different way, it is always hard for the pilots. And the airlines were aware of this and they did these changes in steps during the merger process. Another thing that changed for the pilots when this merger happened was their preferential bidding system. The way that they bid for their flights that they were gonna do in the coming months. Because the way that it works in most airlines is that the pilots will have some say in how their scheduling works. They will, for example, depending on their seniority in the company, where they're based, what they did last month, flight time limitations and so on, be able to impact the type of flights that they want to get in the future. Now, in my airline, I don't have a bidding system. And that's because we are almost all of us living in the base that we operate from and we always come home every night. So this means that it doesn't really matter what uh, destinations you have. But in America, that's not very common. Instead, a lot of the pilots are based in different parts of the United States and they have to fly into their base and operate from there. And because of that, it can have a huge impact on their life quality, what kind of bidding that they are able to get. In the case of the Northwest Delta merger, the bidding system had changed substantially and the pilots had been given 150 pages of instructions on how this new bidding system was going to work. And almost all of them felt that it was very confusing, hard to work with. And this is going to have a substantial impact on what happens on this flight. The pilots of Northwest Flight 188 were both very experienced. The captain was a 53-year-old who were based in Minneapolis, but he was actually living together with his wife in just north of Seattle. This meant that he was trying to bid for flights that happened late in the afternoon on his first day and that finished early in around midday on his last day so he could travel into Minneapolis before his first flight and then travel home after his last flight, thereby minimizing the amount of uh, hotel nights he had to spend in Minneapolis. The days before he started his five-day working pattern where the incident flight happened on his second day, he'd spend off at home together with his wife. On his first duty day, he started at 0630 in the morning as a passive crew member flying on the jump seat from Seattle over to Minneapolis. And he landed a few hours before midday, which was also before he was supposed to start his first duty. He spent that time in the uh, Northwest Airlines crew room talking to a couple of instructors that were available in the crew room about how to work this new bidding system. 
The first officer was also very experienced. He's a 54-year-old who lived in Salem, Oregon, and he had a similar setup to his roster as the captain did. So he would also try to fly in on his first day. On the first day of rostering together, he also departed at 6.30 in the morning. He flew in and he landed about noon, just prior to checking in for his flight out towards San Diego. Just after noon on the 20th of October 2009, the two pilots met for the very first time. They had never flown together before. They uh, met up in the crew room together with the cabin crew. They went through their uh, flight documentation for the flight down from Minneapolis to San Diego. And it looked like a completely normal flight. They went out to the aircraft, boarded the passengers and did a completely uneventful flight down towards San Diego. In San Diego, the pilots had a scheduled 19 hour stop, but the cabin crew returned back towards Minneapolis again. The pilots were picked up by the hotel shuttle bus, they went to the hotel, and at the hotel the wife of the captain was waiting for him. She had actually flown down from Seattle so they could spend the evening together. This meant that the pilot split up, where the captain and his wife went off to have dinner and the first officer went to have dinner by himself. But both of them returned back to the hotel well before midnight and had a full night's sleep, which meant that they were fully rested on the following day, the 21st of October, which is the day of the incident flight. Just before noon, the pilots left the hotel, went out to the airport and started doing their pre-flight preparation. And in the pre-flight preparation, everything looked normal. Uh, the only slight issue was that there was an area of clear air turbulence forecasted along their flight route. So the normal routing had been slightly changed, but there was nothing unusual to that. They were scheduled to climb to a cruise altitude of 35,000 feet, but they could go higher if they needed to. The inbound flight was a little bit late and the cabin crew that was going to fly together with them back to Minneapolis was already on board that flight. When the aircraft finally arrived, the pilots went on board, uh, introduced themselves to the cabin crew. They had a quick briefing where they briefed the lead cabin crew member about the potential turbulence on the flight back. They also checked the technical status of the aircraft, which was fine. There was nothing wrong with the aircraft. The pilots decided that the captain was going to be pilot flying for the flight and the first officer pilot monitoring, meaning that it was the first officer that was in charge of doing the paperwork and talking to our traffic control. The captain set up the flight management computer, the routing that they were going to fly, and he filled it up all the way into the standard arrival route into Minneapolis, but he didn't put the runway in use because at that point they probably didn't know it. They boarded the 144 passengers that was uh, booked for the flight. So on board, as they departed, there were two pilots, three cabin crew and 144 passengers. At time 14.59 Pacific Standard Time, Northwest Flight 188 pushed back from gate at San Diego Airport and started its journey up towards Minneapolis. Initially, the climb out was completely normal. They climbed out to 35,000 feet, which they had initially planned, but Fairly soon after they reached the cruising altitude, they realized that there was quite a bit more turbulence than what they expected. So they requested to climb to a flight of a 370, 37,000 feet instead, and this was approved by a traffic control. The crew executed the climb, and about one hour and 23 minutes after takeoff, they had established themselves at 37,000 feet. The flight time was expected to be around 3 hours and 12 minutes, so that would have them landing about 8 o'clock Central Standard Time. When the aircraft had stabilized itself at 37,000 feet, the pilots decided to take their headsets off and instead they put the volume up on the overhead speaker so they could still hear air traffic control. This way they were a little bit more comfortable and if the first officer needed to talk to air traffic control he could use his hand mic to do so. And this is something you can do on the Airbus A320 because it's reasonably quiet when you're in cruise. On the Boeing 737 that I fly, it is noisy on pretty much any altitude you fly, so we tend to keep our headsets on throughout the flight. And it is a possibility that, that this could have had an impact on what's about to happen. And I'll tell you all about that after this short message from my sponsor. Now, I know that you guys are watching my videos because you love learning new things and finding out the nitty gritty nerdy details behind each story. And if that's true, you should seriously check out the sponsor of this episode, which is CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a high quality subscription streaming service with thousands of great non-fictional stories and documentaries from some of the best filmmakers in the world. I am watching a series right now called What Went Wrong about the Challenger shuttle disaster, which is terrible, but also really, really interesting. If you think, Peter, that sounds really interesting. Well then consider supporting me by supporting my sponsor. Go down into the description, click on the link, which is curiositystream.com slash mentorpilot and the coupon code mentorpilot. That will give you a whopping 25% off the annual subscription fee, which is, wait for it, 
only $14.99 per year, which is insane value for money. Now back to the video. In the cockpit, the way that the two communication radios are set up is that the communication radio number one, which is on the captain's side, is set to the current air traffic control unit. The second communication radio, which is on the first officer's side, is set to the emergency frequency, one to one decimal five, at a slightly lower volume, just to distinguish the two uh, radio frequencies from each other. We always keep 1215 set on the standby radio so that if we would go out of radio contact with the current center that we're talking to, someone else can call in and get us on 1 to 1 decimal 5. So that is something that we always do. Now on this Airbus A320, there was also an ACORS system connected to the communication radio number 3. And that ACORS system um, enables both our traffic control and the company to send the text messages to the pilots. And the way that that works is that the text message will be notified on the ECAM screen inside of the cockpit. And then the pilots will have to open up the message, as in pull out the message manually. It's not going to show up on the ECAM screen. There is a system where the pilots can be audibly notified that they've received an ACORS message through a ding in the cockpit. But unfortunately, this aircraft was not equipped with this. Generally speaking, the Airbus A320s in the Northwest fleet were only equipped with this if they were going to be flying over large stretches of sea. The flight continued completely normally for about two hours when the first officer was in contact with the Denver Center air traffic controller. Around that time, the uh, flight attendant called up the cockpit and asked them if they were interested in getting some food. And we pilots are always interested in getting some food. So they said yes to that, and the captain also took a chance to go out to the toilet. When he got back from the toilet, they uh, got their food, they ate the food, but during the meal they started discussing the new preferential bidding system, the PBS system. The captain explained to the first officer that he was really unhappy with the bids that he had managed to get for the next month because it would force him to do a lot more commuting than what he had hoped for. And the first officer said that he was actually quite confident in how to use this system. When the captain heard this, he took up his own personal laptop and put that in front of him. And he started showing the downloaded file of his bids for the next month to the first officer. The first officer had a look at his screen, listened to what had happened, and then he also took up his own laptop, put it in front of him, and proceeded to, to try to coach the captain on how he was supposed to use the system. It should be mentioned at this point as well that both in Northwest Airline, as in most of the airlines around the world, the pilots are not allowed to use what we call PEDs, personal electronic devices. There's several reasons for that. One of them is that they can distract us. Another thing is that we need actually to have special firefighting procedures for all the electronics that includes batteries that we have inside of the cockpit. But on this occasion, both of the pilots are using their laptops simultaneously. As this conversation is going on between the pilots, the air traffic controller in Denver Center is trying to call the aircraft up to tell them to switch to the next air traffic control frequency. He gets no reply, so he calls again and still there is no reply back. And this is where the Nordo event, no radio communication event, starts. This is also referred to in Europe as a PLOCK event, prolonged loss of communication. If a Nordo event does happen, the air traffic controllers are trained to follow a specific routine. They are you know, supposed to continue to try to reach the aircraft, obviously, but if they can't reach the aircraft within about 10 minutes, they're supposed to get in contact with their FAA representative. That FAA representative is then supposed to send out an alert on something called the US Domestic Event Network. This alert will then notify several government agencies, including the FBI, the Pentagon, and NORAD. And this is generally what gets the fighter jets dispatched to go up and intercept the aircraft to see what's going on. This has obviously become really, really important after the 9-11 attacks, but for some reason, on this occasion, it took much, much longer than the stipulated 10 minutes for this to happen. The air traffic controller has now also reached out to the Northwest Airlines headquarters and told them to please try any means that they have to contact the aircraft. The dispatchers obviously does this, they send several messages up to the aircraft, but remember what I said before, that there was no audible ding being sent through whenever an ACOS message was sent to this particular aircraft. So in this case, both of the pilots are still looking at their laptop. They're still engrossed in this discussion about the bidding system. And none of them notices the messages on their ACAM screen that they have messages from their dispatch. 
The pilots are now discussing more and more details about the preferential bidding system and they're getting really, really into and interested in the discussion. None of them notices that there are several radio calls with the call sign. They both said that they could hear radio chatter in the background, but they didn't recognize that anyone was calling them. Instead, minutes pass by. They fly further and further, and soon they're getting closer to their top of the sand, which is where the uh, flight management computer calculates that they should initiate the descent to start their approach in towards Minneapolis. They pause the top of the sand. This generates a decelerate message on both primary flight displays, basically saying that the aircraft is now going to start to reduce speed back towards the lowest safe speed in order to conserve a little bit of energy. And this is something that the aircraft is programmed to do in case we get a delayed descent clearance by air traffic control. But in this case, none of the pilots realizes that this is happening. Instead, the aircraft just keeps flying along the pre-programmed route towards the start of the standard arrival procedure. Down on the ground, the air traffic controller still cannot get into contact with the aircraft. They just see how the aircraft is getting closer and closer to its destination. The dispatchers inside of the headquarters of Northwest Airlines are starting to get really worried now because they can only see that the aircraft is maintaining 37,000 feet, where it should have been starting to descend long time ago and they don't know whether or not someone has breached the flight deck and maybe the pilots are not even in control of this aircraft. And it's around here, more than an hour into this Nordo event, that the uh, domestic event network finally gets activated. The aircraft just continues to fly along the standard arrival route and when it's getting closer to the final point it has programmed, it sent out a message on the uh, FMC CDU units saying let discount ahead. Basically saying that ahead of me I have a lateral discontinuity, I don't know what you guys want me to do. No one notices this either. Instead, the aircraft flies over the last waypoint and that changes the flight mode enunciator on both primary flight display from navigation to heading mode. So the aircraft just continues to fly straight ahead, maintaining the last heading it had before the last waypoint. At time 20.01 Central Standard Time, this is more or less around the time that they should have been landing, the aircraft overflies Minneapolis Airport at 37,000 feet and continues towards the east. About 12 minutes later, one of the flight attendants calls up the cockpit and asks them about the arrival time. They're getting a little bit worried in the back because they haven't noticed that the aircraft starts to descend. Normally they can hear the engine spooling back and the aircraft pitching down, but they haven't noticed any of that. And they haven't received the normal ding that they get as the aircraft descends through 10,000 feet. And it's at this point that the pilots finally look up from their discussion and realizes that on their navigation display, there is no more data shown. It's just a black screen. They look outside, but they can't see any lights because it's a cloudy evening. The captain reaches over and changes from the normal map mode to the compass rose mode on his navigation display. That way he can see a little bit behind the aircraft as well and realizes that they have overflown Minneapolis and they've flown almost 100 nautical miles east of their destination. The first officer who is in charge of radio communication now tried to call air traffic control but of course the frequencies that they have tuned on their COM1 is from more than an hour and a half ago, so that doesn't work. Instead, he goes over to the secondary radio box where they have one to one small five, the emergency frequency tuned, and he manages to get hold of Winnipeg control. Now, Winnipeg gives them the correct frequency they should be talking to, which is Minneapolis Center. They call them up and tell them that they have been distracted and that they want to turn 180 degrees around to come in and do an approach in from the east instead. Air traffic control are obviously very relieved to get back into contact with the pilots, but they're also a little bit suspicious. They don't know if it's actually the pilots that they're speaking to. So they ask the pilots the reason that they have been in Nordo for that long. The pilot just states that they were distracted and they can't go further into it than that. The air traffic controllers then give them several turns left and right, and they also clear them for first one, then a second um, arrival route, just to make sure that the aircraft is actually following their instructions. During the descent, the pilots are also asked by air traffic control to confirm that the flight deck is secure. 
As this is happening, the first officer also looks down onto their ECAM display and realizes that they have several ACARS messages. He pulls them up and sees that there are a number of messages saying contact air traffic control. But unfortunately, as he goes in and wants to read them, he presses the delete all button instead, which takes away all of the ACARS messages. Since the pilots are now back in radio contact with the air traffic controllers, NORAD can stand down the fighter jets that they were about to send up to intercept the aircraft. The captain also makes a PA to the passengers now, updating them on the new arrival time, which is going to be in about 23 to 25 minutes from when he made the PA. And at time 21.07, more than an hour after their expected original landing time, Northwest Airlines Flight 188 lands safely in Minneapolis. The aircraft taxis in, pulls up onto the parking gate and is met by several representatives of law enforcement including police officers and also a uh, representative of the Northwest Airlines Chief Pilot Office. The pilots are given a breathalyzer test to make sure that they don't have alcohol in the blood and they're also having to give an initial statement on why it was that this happened and they continue to state that they got distracted. This incident got a lot of media attention and that's completely understandable because it's not often that you see an aircraft miss its destination with over 100 nautical miles. The investigation into what actually went on in the cockpit was a little bit hampered by the fact that the investigators didn't get access to a large chunk of the cockpit voice recorder and that was because the aircraft had been powered up and powered down several times before the cockpit voice recorder was taken out and that had eaten into the recording so they only had about 15 minutes. But they did have all of the statement from both the pilots, from the cabin crew and from the air traffic controllers. And what they came up with was that the pilots had indeed become very, very uh, distracted. They had lost their situational awareness completely because they were using their personal electronic devices, which they were not allowed to do. And that led to this very long 91 minute Nordo event. As a consequence of this, the FAA chose to revoke both of the pilot's licenses within days of the event. This meant that the pilot lost their employment with Northwest Airlines, the captain decided to pre-retire and the first officer never got back into employment with Northwest again. So what do I think about this then? Well, I think that this clearly shows how dangerous it can be with distractions on the flight deck and how personal electronic devices and the use of them in the cockpit could lead up to distractions like this. As a pilot, we have to maintain situational awareness at all times. We have to know what's going on, where we are and who we're talking to. There are mitigation procedures to avoid plocks or Nordo events. For example, we are taught to every 20 minutes, if we haven't heard or think we haven't heard our own call sign, call up on the radio frequency and do a radio check. We're also supposed to keep track of when we move past FIR boundaries in the airspace because that's when we normally get transferred over. If we haven't heard anything, we need to check why that is. And there are many other techniques like that. Like for example, using headset and making sure that the volume is loud enough so that you can hear it. And the use of one to one decimal five on a volume that you can actually hear. But I have to also say that I feel really sorry for these guys, right? There's no excuse for not getting into contact with our traffic control for an hour and a half and overflying your destination. It shows really bad situational awareness together. But all of their training records and everything shows that these two pilots were actually good pilots that just got deeply, deeply distracted. This is, by the way, also why we are not supposed to get into really charged conversations while we're flying. This is why we avoid talking politics or religion, for example, because once you do start talk about something like this, something that really interests you, you forget about time and you forget about what's going on around you. Now, if the other part of the system would have worked, if NORAD would have sent up the fighter jets and they would have been intercepted, well, then this incident might have ended with an embarrassing trip to the chief pilot's office and maybe some retraining rather than losing their licenses. These events do occur. Aircraft are intercepted on an almost daily basis because of prolonged loss of communication, but it doesn't lead to a career ending event. Now, if you want to see another video that I think that you'll find really interesting, well then check out the video up here. If you want to support the work that I do here on Mentor Pilot, then consider becoming a part of my Patreon crew. We have weekly hangouts, which I know that you guys will love, or you can also get yourself a t-shirt. 
Have a fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.